I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness. Right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Well, little Miss Honey, how are you today? Oh, I'm just fine, and I'm so excited. What for? Well, Halloween is going to come, and I've got my jack-o'-lantern all fixed up, and I'm going to scare people. Well, what are you going to do if people scare you? <laughs> I won't be scared because I know it's all in fun. Then how do you know you'll scare other people? Maybe they'll know it's all in fun, too. Well, I mean, just sort of pretend scared, you know. Yes, I think I do. Halloween is a wonderful time, and I'm looking forward to it. Yes, and so am I. And so am I. And I'm looking forward to the funnies, too. So read them for me, will you, please? Fuck the Comic Weekly? Yes. Very well, I will in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. Top of the first page, hop along, Cassidy. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Six guns blazing as he thunders along. Give us music for hop along. Hoppy and the cavalry were heading back to Denver. As they were making their way through a mountain pass, they were attacked by Indians. Arrows came flying from nowhere. And one of their men is picked off. As they gather around him quickly, another of the troopers says, Hey, they're picking off our rear guard. Poor Evans. Hoppy looks at the arrow in the back of the dead man, recognizes the tribe from which it came. He says, Sue. Last picture top row, the major says, This is Chief Ironclaw's work. For months, somebody's been smuggling firearms to his renegades faster than we can disarm them. As they quickly bury the dead man, Hoppy says, First picture next row. Well, I don't think they plan an attack just yet or they wouldn't have warned us by picking off our rear guard. Yeah, I guess you're right, Cassidy. Iron Claw's probably waiting for reinforcements before hitting us. As they prepare to mount again, last picture, middle row, Hoppy advises, Oh, Major, I'd suggest we keep on the move. We'll have a better chance if we can get out of this wash. The Major replies, Right. Prepare to mount. Continue on their way. Sometime later, first picture bottom row, another arrow cuts through the air. <laughs> One of their troopers is wounded in the shoulder. The major looks back and says to his men, Help Willis with the arrow, but keep on the move. We'll head for the stage relay station at Medicine Bend. It's our nearest shelter against Redskin attack. Last picture, they come out of a grove of trees into a clearing. And ahead, they see a stockade in a cabin. The major announces... Ah, there's our objective. It's sturdy enough to discourage Iron Claw's tribe. But he doesn't see arrows sticking out of the walls of the stockade and the bodies of two men lying outside, struck down by the Indians. Oh, isn't that terrible? Those Indians have been there, too. Yes. Doesn't look as though there's much room for the troopers to find protection. And, and Hoppy said the Indians are waiting to get more enforcements. Well, that means more of them. Yes, there's plenty of danger in this adventure. We'll find out more about it next week. Now? Oh, now let's turn over the page because I know Prince Valiant will be there. Very well, over the page we go. And, and you remember last week when Prince Valiant came home, he found out he was the father of little baby twin girls and they were so sweet. Yes, and you remember also that Val's son, Prince Arn, was very unhappy because no one paid any attention to him. Yes, and that's very wrong. Let's read now and see if they, they make him happy. Very well, here we go with Prince Valiant in the days of King Arthur. Eckert, Breckett, Gray Malkin, and Quince. Music romantic for a fair, fair prince. <laughs> Little Prince Arn stands sadly in the doorway. He's hidden in the folds of the drape, unseen by Val, who is fussing over his twin daughters. The little prince sadly goes to his own room, gets his wooden sword and toys, and first picture next row sorrowfully walks down the hall, planning to go away all by himself. 
But Val looks up and sees him going past the door, and he lets out a glad shout. Arn, come here! Val rushes to the doorway, picks up little Prince Arn, and gives him a great big hug. Arn smiles happily to realize that his daddy has noticed him. And then, first picture, bottom row, Val opens up a saddlebag, telling him there are presents within it for him. And Val also gives Alita lovely presents, for which she gives him a big, big hug, which little Prince Arn thinks is very silly. Last picture, Prince Arn is dressed in a helmet, jacket, shield, and sword, his presents, and stands there looking like a warrior ready for adventure at the sturdy age of two and a half. Yes, it's too big for him, but he doesn't think so. <laughs> yes, he's so proud that his daddy pays attention to him. I said that Val would be nice to him. You did, and you were right. Now let's go over the page. All right. Oh, look, here's Donald Duck. And we won't waste another second. Here we go with Donald Duck. Say the magic words with me. Squeeze him, 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 squeeze him,
<laughs> then taking the jailer's keys, as fast as he can, Dick releases his friends around him. He goes from one cell to the other, unlocking the doors. But the Bashaw's well-armed guards are pounding down the corridor. They've heard the shout. Without weapons, it is foolhardy to fight. Last picture, Middle Road, Dick and his companions scatter. But not before they can help themselves to the guards' cloaks. And they disappear before the approaching guards can get their hands on them. First picture, bottom row, the guards search through the palace grounds. But the captives have vanished. Dick and his friends are free. Last picture, an hour later, several miles away, the camel train of Abdul the Trader proceeds with a group of heavily cloaked Bedouins who come from no one knows where. A close look under the hoods of the Bedouins would show that these men wearing the striped tunics are Dick and the Yankee prisoners. Yes, and if no one asks any questions, maybe by nightfall they can be far enough away to slip back to their ship. Oh, I hope so. Well, maybe we'll find that out next week. And now, look, underneath Dick's adventures. Oh, yes, Rusty Rally. And you remember, Rusty and Tex have gone to the county fair, and they're going to run that wonderful horse Snowflake in the race. Yes, and Mr. Crumb, the crooked owner of the Grassy Acres farm, is running his horse, Pooh Bah. And uh, his men, who are crooks too, have hidden a gun under the seat of the Ferris wheel, and that's right by the racetrack. And I'm afraid they might try to do something terrible like shooting snowflakes so that their horse will win. Well, don't forget that Tex and Mr. Miles are talking to two detectives. Maybe they'll find a way of stopping this. Oh, quick. Let's read so we can find out. Very well. Here we go with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. <laughs> Tex, Mr. Miles, and the two detectives are talking outside the grandstand of the fairgrounds. Tex is saying, uh, Two of Crumb's tutors are working here, running the shooting gallery in the Ferris wheel. Maybe you notice the big wheel is real close to the racetrack fence. Mr. Miles replies, second picture. Uh, yes, I noticed that. I thought of having it stopped during the races. It might frighten the horse. Tex goes on last picture top row. Well, these owl hoots are frequent to use a powerful air gun, most likely a target pistol. They got it hid under the seat cushion of car 10 in the Ferris wheel. It's a good bet they're up to no good. One of the detectives answers, well, leave it to us, Tex. We'll take care of them. First picture next row. A few minutes later, Tex is talking to Rusty, who's on the racing sulky, ready to drive Snowflake out on the track. Tex says... Okay, Rusty. Get out there now and drive a good race. Just keep your eye on Crumb's driver and don't you worry. Everything's under control. Right, Tex. I'm not afraid. <laughs> Meanwhile, the two detectives head for the Ferris wheel. As they near it, one of them says, third picture bottom row. Hey, hold it, Jackson. Look. They stopped the wheel with car 10 at the top. Jackson answers... Yeah, probably, with one of those hoods in it. Hey, come on, I got an idea. He goes on. Last picture, Lewis says, I want you to get that engineer away from that machinery for a few minutes as soon as the race starts. I don't care how you do it, but get him away. Oh, I know what he plans to do. If he can get the engineer away from the Ferris wheel, and then when the race starts, then he's going to start the Ferris wheel so that car number 10 moves around so the man in it can't shoot that snowflake. I have a hunch that's his idea. Oh, I, I wonder if he'll be able to work it. Well, we'll find that out next week. Now? Oh, now? Now it's time for Dag Wooden Von D. Yes, and here they are on the first page of the second section, and I'll read that in just a minute. But first, here's that nice man with something interesting to say. Now, here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. First page of the second section, Dagwood and Blondie. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Ram a foo, ram a fum, zim, zam, zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. <laughs> the postman comes up Dagwood's walk, drops a letter in the box, blows his whistle like mad. Dagwood, in the house, hears it and dashes for the door. Says, Mr. Beasley's blowing his whistle like mad. He must have a terribly important letter for me. 
The postman goes down the street blowing his whistle. Dagwood pokes his hand in the letterbox, last picture top row, saying, What could it be that could make him blow his whistle like that? He tries to pull the letter out, but nothing moves. He tries again. Nothing moves. He yells, first picture bottom row, first picture next row. Blondie, help, help! My hand's caught in the mailbox. Blondie dashes out. Sees Dagwood's predicament and asks him how he did it. Dagwood answers, stop asking questions and pull. He puts his foot against the wall. Blondie pulls and he pushes. Uh, try again. Uh, they try a second time. Try again. And finally, a third time. Uh, the mail doctor pulls loose. They both fall over backwards. But Dagwood's hand is still in the mailbox. So, first picture, third row, they dash downtown to the Fix-It Repair Shop. A man at the Fix-It Repair Shop puts Dagwood's arm in a vise and begins to hammer away at the mailbox. Dagwood says, Hurry! I can't wait till I see what that card in the box is. The repair man answers cheerfully, Well, it's coming off. He hits it another blow, and up it pops. He shakes out a card. Mr. Fix-It looks at the card. Last picture, third row, says with a smile, well, what do you know? It's a little advertising card I sent out. Mr. Fix-It, I can repair anything. Well, well, well. <laughs> First picture, bottom row, Mr. Fix-It says, That'll be two dollars. Amazing what a quick response I got from it. Dagwood hands him the money. With a ferocious look on his face, snarls, Now I want to find Beasley. <laughs> Down the street he dashes. He sees a mailbox. A mailman two blocks away. He catches up with him, dashes up to him yelling, Why all that noise in the whistle when you put that card in my box? The mailman answers, Why, it's a new whistle my wife gave me for my birthday, and I just love it. Whereupon Dagwood sails into him. Hey, now, Mr. Bump. Now, Mr. Bump. <laughs> Last picture, the mailman lies on the ground with a black eye, and he moans, Billions of people on this earth, and I had to get Bumpstead on my route. Dagwood dusts off his hands and walks off, saying, Now oh, I feel better. Oh, I don't blame him for getting mad at the mailman for blowing his whistle so much for no good reason at I all. don't blame him either. But he might have been a little more cautious when he stuck his hand in that mailbox. Yes, he might have been a little more cautious when he stuck his hand in that mailbox and he wouldn't have all that trouble. No. Now? Oh, look, at the bottom of the page is Roy Rogers. And this is so exciting because you remember last week, Roy and Jack Spratt, the deputy sheriff, were being treated rough by the cattleman when a man that we think is Blot Kramer stepped out from nowhere and made the cattleman let Roy and Jack go. Yes, and then Roy and Jack Spratt galloped off to investigate more about what part Mr. Norton plays in all this. Uh, yes, and Mr. Morton said that a man named Ma uh, Blot Kramer is a cattle rustler, and I'm anxious to find out if that's true. Well, let's find out right now. Here we go with Roy Rogers, king of the cowboys. Hi yip hi -oh. Now here we go with Roy and Trigger. Hi yip hi -oh. Roy and Jack Spratt head for Blot Kramer's ranch to investigate why the cattleman's consul took it over so quickly after running Kramer out. They pull up in front of the gate leading into the ranch. Find a sign tacked onto it reading... No trespassing, by order of the cattleman's consul. As they stop, Jack Spratt says, second picture. After Brad and Kramer are rustling and running them out of town, they didn't waste no time fencing off his property. Start to open the gate, but the hinges are rusty. They squeak. Last picture, top row, a guard pokes a gun over the bluff above, calling, Halt! Oh, yo, Jack Spratt. Can't you read? Even deputy sheriffs ain't allowed in here. Jack Spratt answers, Is that so? Hey, don't I smell cooking? The guard doesn't see Roy, who is behind a rock. Roy slips around behind the guard to sneak up on him while he talks with Jack Spratt. Meanwhile, the old-timer who had rescued Roy and Jack earlier comes up from around a curve. First picture bottom row, he sees what's going on and stops. He says, Well, Norton's guard stopped Spratt and Rogers just when I was hoping they'd sneak around my ranch and learn exactly why Norton's cattleman's consul free me. Well, I'll fix it. Nobody knows me decked out in these prospectors duds anyway. At this moment, Roy, who has slipped up behind the guard, whips his rope over him. At the same second, the old-timer pulls the trigger. <coughs> Third picture bottom, Roy, excla Roy exclaims. Hey, somebody plug the guard. Grab him, Jack. I'm afraid he's done for. Wonder who shot him. Spratt replies. 
Well, I don't know, but I see a couple of familiar hombres coming, Roy. Clay Norton and Carp Mallory. We're sure in the jam now. As the old-timer gallops off, Mallory and Norton approach last picture. Mallory exclaims, Hey, Norton, look. That old desert rat with one finger missing. The one you reckon is Blot Kramer in disguise. Norton answers, Well, let him go. We gotta stop Rogers and Jack Spratt before they find out too much. Yes, looks as though Mallory and Norton would pin the crime on them. Oh, now that Kramer got Roy into real trouble, didn't he? It looks that way. But we'll find out next week. Now, let's go over the page. All right. Oh, look, here's Flash Gordon. You remember, Flash was on his way to Mars on a special uh, investigation. Yes, that's right. And just as they neared the city on Mars, rocket ships came out. They sent out some sort of tentacles, just sucked Flash's ship right down to the ground. Yes, I want to see what happens. Will they make Flash a prisoner? We'll, we'll find out right away. Now, here we go with Flash Gordon. Rega rega doon doon, ask him a tash. Let's have music for Heroic Flash. <laughs> Forced down by the strange spin ships, Flash's rocket is grounded on Mars. The hood of one of the spin ships opens, and a Martian of a very different race from Toxo the Pirate gestures for the humans to alight. Flash tests the air, finding it thin but breathable. Last picture, top row, with his hand near his hidden ray gun. Flash watches carefully as the Martian comes close. He touches Dale's hand lightly. Dale tells Flash that she seems to sense what the Martian is saying. He wants to take them to his ruler, Menta. They walk to the Martian's car, get in, and the car goes off. It's a caterpillar job. First picture bottom row, as they speed toward the city in a sand car fitted for desert travel, their guide hands them earplugs. Cautiously, Flash tries a pair. He finds that they are mind senders, which enable the Martians to talk with him. Swiftly, the car approaches one of the gates to the city. As the car rolls through the gate, the Martian guide answers Flash's questions about the planet's ruler. He exclaims, Mentor has the greatest brain on Mars. Thus, she is the queen. In a few minutes, Flash, last picture, finds himself before Queen Menta. He tells her, We come in peace. Menta stares at him grimly and then tells him to give up their concealed ray guns or her guards will freeze them instantly if he dares try violence. Oh, what does she mean, freeze them? Well, apparently those guns that the Martian guards are carrying eject a kind of ray that will freeze you solidly so you can't move. Oh, what an awful weapon. Yes, it is in a way, but yet it's better than killing. Oh, you mean because they can unfreeze you when they want to? Yes, possibly. Oh, I wouldn't like it anyway. I wonder if the queen will be friendly or not. Well, that's something we'll find out next week. Now? Oh, you haven't read Alice in Wonderland? Oh, no, we haven't, and we'll take care of that right away. Go across the page, past the Lone Ranger, turn over that page. Oh, look, here on the next page, here's Alice in Wonderland. And you remember last week she was only three inches tall, and she met the funny little caterpillar who huffed and puffed and became very angry when Alice said that she would like to be tall. Yes, that's right. And then the caterpillar turned into a butterfly. Yes, and then the butterfly told Alice that if she would eat a piece of mushroom, she might grow big. So please read now and see whether she does. Very well. Now here we go with Alice in Wonderland. Say the magic words with me. And, and now, now for, for a story, story that, that gets, gets curiouser and, and curiouser. Alice, Alice in Wonderland. Wonderland. So the music, music sir. sir. Music, music, sir. Alice nibbles on one piece of the mushroom. Instantly, she grows skyward. She grows so tall, her head goes right through the trees and towers above it with a bird's nest on her head. The mother bird flies off the nest, saying, What a very idea. Look, spend all my time laying eggs, and then you come along. Alice exclaims, But, but I... And Alice puts the nest back in the tree, and the mother bird flies back to it. Third picture, Alice bites into a second piece of mushroom, and shrinks down. 
and regains her normal size. Alice exclaims, There, I'm myself again. But I'd better save these pieces of mushroom. And then she goes in search of the white rabbit. Last picture top row, she wanders into a shadowy grove. She sees all kinds of signs. One says, this way. Another says, that way. Another says, up. Another, down. Another, back. Another, yonder. Alice exclaims, mm, I wonder which way. And then, first picture bottom row, a voice from a tree says, Wow, you really want to know? He went that way. Oh, uh, who went which way? The Cheshire Cat, for it is indeed he, finally tells Alice where the white rabbit went. Wow, he went uh, to the Marchers' house. Wow. Alice exclaims. Oh, thank you. And the Cheshire Cat continues, third picture, bottom row. Wow, the Marchers' man. So is the Mad Hatter. Alice says to herself. And you're not all there either. And then wanders through a path down through the trees. Last picture, she comes to a funny little house with Japanese lanterns hanging around the trees. Alice exclaims, My goodness, I wonder what will happen to me here. But despite the Cheshire Cat's warning, Alice hurries toward the odd, thatched house of the March Hare. a cute little house? Yes, it is. I'm afraid Alice is going to find a funny adventure with a Mad Hatter. Oh, yes, but I'm sure it won't be very dangerous. Well, I hope not. Oh, I'm so anxious to find out what it is. Well, that's something we'll find out next week. Now, that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I gotta go now. All right, Mr. Tony Weekly Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date, and a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man. The Jolly Comic Weekly Man.